Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with James Manicum on looming East Asian challenges. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. I'm David Welch, the CG Chair of Global Security at the Balsley School of International Affairs and Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo. And every week I'm pleased to welcome a guest into the studios here at the Center for International Governance Innovation in Waterloo, Ontario, uh, to speak about some particular issue of uh, relevance to global governance. Today, I'm very happy to welcome James Manicum, who is a Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council postdoctoral fellow at the Balsillie School of International Affairs, and uh, a noted expert particularly on East Asian security issues. And so, welcome James, and uh, I'd like to chat with you mostly about East Asian security challenges, but of course, in this modern globalized world, it's hard to keep watertight boxes between security issues and non-security issues, and so perhaps we'll touch on a couple of economic and trade-related issues as well, because they're implicated. Uh, but if it's all right with you, I'd like to start by asking you about a subject you've done some work on uh, that's of particular interest to me, and I think puzzling to a lot of people, and that is the uh, South China Sea. It's one of the areas of the world in which uh, a number of countries who are uh, known not to back down in the face of challenges have competing and overlapping territorial claims, and it's been the site of some interesting international frictions. Many people consider it one of the most serious potential hotspots in the world today. Uh, can you tell us a bit about your understanding of the South China Sea situation uh, today, uh, how the issue is evolving at all, and how we might see it develop over the course of the next few years. Absolutely. Um, I think the, uh, the origin of, of the headlines about the South China Sea today uh, date back to 2010 uh, when there were a series of crises, if you like, over, uh, over the, the exercise of jurisdiction in, East, in the South China Sea or in Southeast Asian waters. Uh, all coastal states that border the South China Sea uh, uh, exercise jurisdiction over areas they claim uh, an EEZ, an, ex an economic exclusive zone, uh, over. Uh, and because those claims overlap, uh, part of what they interpret their responsibility to be is to prevent other states from also enforcing uh, their jurisdiction over the same water. Uh, this is jurisdiction over resource exploration and fisheries uh, 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 as well. Uh, and what you had in the court over the course of 2010 was a series of events where uh, China, the Philippines, and Vietnam in particular were found to confront one another with their enforce enforcement vessels, uh, civilian fishing vessels, uh, and military vessels uh, in areas they both claim. Um, and that's sort of what has what brought, that's what catalyzed this latest phase of South China Sea tensions. The claims themselves, of course, go back decades. Uh, claims to the island features, the Spratly Island features, go back uh, quite some time. With the law of the sea coming into force in 1994, uh, states occupied those features and claimed EEZs from them, uh, which is where their claims, the, the origin, if you like, of their overlapping claims. Mm -hmm. Now, for people who are, aren't familiar with the geography and the details of the overlapping claims, so there are, there are competing claims to islands. Yes, there are. Or, or rocks, islands and or rocks. rocks. Although there are some inhabitants of at least some of these rocks, right? Some of these countries do maintain either outposts or temporary mm. shelters for fishermen. Yes. Yes, uh, all, of, all of the Spratly features have been occupied in some way. Uh, occupied meaning building some kind of uh, installation or structure, yes. Oftentimes just a simple cinder, uh, a concrete structure. Uh, one of them, Ituaba, which is occupied by Taiwan, is the biggest island. It has, has an actual runway uh, on it. Uh, you can't land a very large plane there, but it does have a runway on it, which by definition gives it a degree of military or tactical uh, military significance. Um, uh, Vietnam occupies the most, the largest number of features, uh, followed by China, um, and Malaysia occupies uh, several. Uh, and Brunei simply claims an EEZ uh, into the, the into the South China Sea from its coastal its coastal base, baseline from its yeah its baselines. Um, uh, yeah, that's sort of the gist of the background. And the the maritime claims uh, that don't involve the the features, the rocks. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned fisheries, very yeah. rich. Fishing grounds, I Rich understand. Fishing grounds, um, yeah. I, I don't remember the exact figure I saw, but my understanding is that China relies quite heavily 
on fishing in the South China Sea specifically? It does, as do, as do Vietnamese fishermen. And one of the problem with fish is they don't follow international boundaries. Uh, and one of the problem with fishermen is that fishing is very much a, a multi-generational industry. It's if your father fished, his grandfather fished, and you've been fishing the same waters for generations and generations. Uh, so you're not going to take well to another country's vessel showing up and telling you you can't fish there anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly governments in every uh, country, claimant country have done, in, in their interpretation, a good job of trying to stand up for the rights of their fishermen. In 2010, things did get violent. Um, Chinese fishing boat, uh, uh, fisheries enforcement vessels fired warning shots at uh, Vietnamese fishing boats, driving them away. This was to enforce China's annual fishing ban uh, in a certain part of the South China Sea. And what's appeared, I guess, what, what inflamed Vietnamese sensitivities was that the next day, uh, fishing boats went back, Vietnamese fishing bo boats went back to the site and actually found Chinese fishing boats fishing those same waters. So in violation of the Chinese. In violation ban. of the Chinese uh, fishing, fishing uh, ban. Now, I don't want to accuse China more than other countries of being to blame. Uh, all countries have taken steps which you could argue are unhelpful to the building of confidence and the keeping of peace. Uh, Vietnam and Malaysia have both declared certain islands tourist spots, and so they've, they're building scuba diving resorts on some of these things because there's a lot to see in the, in the ocean around there for scuba diving. So, and in, in creating this tourism hotspot, that is also a tourism destination that is also a form of exercise of jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And there are also hydrocarbons, right? There are, Considerable well... Considerable proven oil and natural gas deposits. Depends on the bar of proof. Uh, we think there are... Uh, significant hydrocarbons. Um, this all stems, to the best of my knowledge, from a report uh, in 1969 that basically announced that the East China Sea and South China Sea, that entire seabed, could be a large, uh, could hold a large deposits of hydrocarbons. So uh, China has found a number of, of, of productive deep water gas fields off the southern coast of China, and Vietnam is ex exploring for resources as well. And again, the challenge is that this is happening in another state's, uh, in right. a contested area of contested jurisdiction. I imagine there would be more drilling for exploration if there weren't these competing claims. People are a little bit careful about Certainly multinationals are. situation. Certainly multinationals are. Multinational oil companies are reluctant, typically, to go into an area that is contested because of a simple risk premium. Right. Um, I, I want to, I, I would hesitate to suggest that the, the oil and gas reserves of the South China Sea are sufficient enough to justify conflict. Uh, in my view, it is less the existence of the reserves themselves which, which explain state behavior as much as it is the, the act of, of exploring those is an expression of jurisdiction. Right. That's what states are worried about. It's the expression of jurisdiction rather than the actual harvesting or, or exploiting of oil and gas resources. Because you can right. get oil and gas resources from the international market. Mm -hmm. right? It's less about the money and the long-term implications uh, for the exercise of jurisdiction. Economics is the continuation of politics by other means. Certainly is. We'll be back in a moment with James Manicum to talk about looming East Asian challenges. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So James, you mentioned that actually there's a runway in the South China Sea and it's occupied by Taiwan. Taiwan. So I'd like to actually talk about a couple of other players, not just about the South China Sea, but I imagine that the fact that Taiwan occupies, maintains a runway in the, in the uh, South China Sea uh, interestingly complicates mainland China's reaction to South China Sea disputes because as we all know, another classic hotspot in mm. East Asia is the Taiwan Strait. That's been an area where there certainly has been military conflict since the Second World War. Uh, mm -hmm. Active shelling, yes. uh, people dying. Yeah. Uh, we haven't seen people dying in that conflict for a while, but uh, can you walk us a bit through the current state of the Taiwan sure. mainland Chinese relationship and then we'll broaden it out a bit to talk about the sure. American role in, in that and other places. Yeah, well, um, as you know, Taiwan, uh, China claims Taiwan as a as a rogue province. Uh, Taiwan is the the the, the uh, is where the KMT fled to after the Chinese Civil War. They set up Taiwan. It's for all intents and purposes its own state, but very few countries recognize it as an independent state. Um, the Taiwan China relationship took a bit of a downturn uh, from about the late '90s onwards. There was uh, two uh, fiercely pro-independent pre uh, presidents in a row: Li Tenghui and Chen Shui-bian. Who, uh, who are from opposite political parties, uh, 
uh, both uh, said things, characterized the cross-strait relationship in ways that China found provocative. Chen Shui-bian, who, who followed Li Tenghui, threatened to have a referendum on the question of independence. Uh, and these are things that China had long, uh, had long stated would, would, would trigger China's promise uh, to, to uh, uh, attack the island and force reunification. Um, in, in 2005, uh, China passed the anti-secession law, uh, which basically legalized China's long-standing uh, 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 view or, or promise that it would, it would, it would uh, launch an attack on Taiwan if reunification became impossible. Uh, in 2008, uh, Beijing moved away from that sort of more assertive posture and actually started to say a lot of nice things to Taiwan and basically tried to, to reach out to Taiwan. And that was because ahead of the 2004 election, they wanted to threaten the Taiwanese away from, getting, from having Chen Shui-bian elected. They elected Chen Shui-bian again uh, because he was uh, a pro-independence um, uh, leader and they were not, the Taiwanese people were not uh, amenable to being threatened by China. In 2008, China wants to change this, uh, wants to influence again the election on, on, uh, on, on Taiwan and does so in a way that it does not involve threatening. They actually reach out um, a lot of sort of very soft rhetoric towards Taiwan. A I'm sunshine not, policy approach. A sunshine, if you like, yeah, for, to draw a Korean analogy. Um, and so Ma Ying-jeou sort of picks that up and, and runs that and is elected uh, on a conciliatory platform uh, w uh, uh, with, with Beijing. Uh, and since then, the relationship has gotten quite close. Uh, they've, they've established what, the, what they call the three links, which had, had long been a, a goal of the cross-strait dialogue was to establish three links between Taiwan and China, the postal link, the shipping link, and the uh, uh, direct air flight link, because prior to those things, everything had to go through Hong Kong. Uh, and now they had to have direct flights, they have direct postal services, direct shipping, and that has done a lot to boost economic relations between the two. And then in June of 2010, I think, they also signed an economic cooperation framework agreement. So the relationship is getting a lot closer. There's a few ways to view this. China, I suspect, now takes the long view on reunification, it has so for quite, for quite some time, and views economic absorption as the way forward. Uh, there are millions of Taiwanese people living, living in, in, in China, billions of dollars of investment in the Chinese economy, and the Taiwanese economy is certainly becoming very dependent on the mainland economy. So China might view these three links and the economic cooperation agreement as a way to effectively absorb Taiwan over time. What Ma has been able to achieve has been a, a, a reduction of tension across the Taiwan Strait. He's, there's some speculation that he has actually managed to secure promises to, to reduce the, the, the missile um, uh, 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 deployment that is aimed at Taiwan. I'm not that that is yet to be confirmed, but there's this suspicion that he has managed to get the, t the Chinese to step back from their the, the military dimension of their mm -hmm. threat. So that's uh, that's sort of where the situation is. But is now. this raising expectations in Beijing? Is it sort of making leaders in mm -hmm. Beijing think in terms of a timetable for reunification? Things are going well, therefore we now expect to achieve a reunification sooner than we thought? Yeah, I think it depends who you ask in Beijing. Uh, during leadership transitions in authoritarian countries, uh, uh, those, these kinds of issues of sovereignty become quite, quite sensitive. Uh, everything I've read suggests that the next generation leadership intends to continue this relatively soft line reunification when it happens model uh, to approach, if you like, towards Taiwan. However, there are certainly elements, hardline element, elements, if you like, uh, within within Beijing, who who may try to pressure a new leadership uh, to to to, uh, to to push things a little bit. We've seen new leaders do this in the past. Jiang, both Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao took hard lines on Taiwan when they were first in power. The anti secession law I mentioned was was mm -hmm. that for for, for uh, Hu Jintao, and Jiang Zemin was the one who launched the missile strikes over Taiwan in 1996 because we think he needed to prove himself to the PLA. So in the past, changes in leadership in China have resulted in a hardening of Taiwan policy. So is it working on the uh, Taiwanese people? Are they beginning to think now more positively about reunification? Not to, not to my knowledge. As far as I know, that the Taiwanese people are pragmatic and not suicidal. Uh, they prefer the status quo. Um, it, interestingly, most of the criticisms about the Ma administration are, are related to economic issues and economic stagnation rather than the handling of the cross-strait relationship, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, so the Taiwanese people, I think, are, are independent. There is a Taiwanese identity amongst them, and they are becoming more independent as generations change. Uh, whether and if this smile offensive, if you like, towards Taiwan uh, from China is going to have a meaningful impact on reunifi reunification, it could take a generation. Mm. Well, we'll be back again to speak further with James Manicum. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. 
Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. Uh, now, James, the United States, of course, is not an East Asian country, but it's certainly an East Asian player and has been since the Second World War. And the United States has a law which obliges it to come to the defense of Taiwan if attacked by mainland China. Uh, so there's some obvious potential here for some serious escalation to great power conflict. What's your read on American attitudes toward their own commitment to Taiwan? How is that playing out mm. in terms of American policy toward Taiwan? And how's it playing out in Taiwan? Are the Taiwanese doing anything differently as a result of their calculations about what Washington might or might not be willing to do in the event of a crisis? Yeah, uh, this has been a big year for Taiwan uh, policy debates in Washington, D.C. Uh, we've seen there's been an abandonment group within Washington that argues that, that the, the, the defense of Taiwan is not a, a vital national interest. Uh, and that's realist, hard, well, I suppose classical realists like Charles Glazer made that argument last year in Foreign Affairs that, you know, the defense of Taiwan is not a, 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 a national interest in the United States. And so it's, it's, it's basically a military adventure, not something a realist state would, pers would, would, would occupy itself with. Uh, and that, in the light of the financial crisis and what we uh, expect will be serious cuts to the U.S. defense budget, there's a growing chorus of voices calling for the United States to abandon Taiwan on the, the grounds that the United States can't afford to make, to maintain uh, its force presence, a, a force presence in the region that is a credible, a credible deterrent to China. And, and also, um, uh, simply because the, the Taiwan issue gets in the way of improved relations with Beijing. If America gets some very hopefully good concessions from China, if it uh, abandoned Taiwan and World Trade Organization uh, disputes China's yuan value and so forth, um, that is balanced by uh, a, a, an alternative argument that looks at the United States as a Pacific power, uh, one whose presence in the region is not connected entirely with Taiwan. It is connected with its hubs and spokes alliance system with Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, uh, and Thailand. Uh, and really, for these people, the Taiwan issue is just one of a set of a broader security issues in the region. I think the latter debate has, the, it has won uh, since Barack Obama has been in Asia of late, uh, saying those kinds of things, promising uh, to maintain the U.S. De uh, deployments in the region, the military presence in the region, regardless of, of, of any budget cuts that might come. But the American attachment to Taiwan is not, strictly speaking, a classical realist national interest kind of attachment, no. is it? I mean, it's... They're a democracy. Yeah. No, that wasn't originally the case because the no. GMT was no, not, no, no, not no. a very democratic uh, party no, it in wasn't. Taiwan. was Until more or less 80, authoritarian. 92 or 88. But at least yeah. they weren't communist, right? So they exactly. were on the right side of that. Better dead but than red. But it's difficult for Americans to abandon democracies in the face of authoritarian challenges. It certainly is. And that is, that is an argument that has bipartisan uh, support in the, in the, in the U.S. Uh, there are members of both Republican and Democratic parties who view Taiwan as worth defending on the grounds that they are like-minded. They are like Americans. They are capitalists. They, are, they, are, uh, uh, they live in a democratic society that has uh, uh, free media. And China has none of those things right. and inc is increasingly less and less capitalist. Um, as to how this is perceived in Taiwan, the Taiwanese are obviously worried about that. Uh, what Taiwan can do about that in a meaningful sense, uh, very little, I think. T t Taiwan used to have the military edge in the cross-strait relationship. They don't anymore. Um, and, and Taiwan is, if left to fend for itself, would have a hard time uh, uh, fielding the requisite military capabilities to keep a Chinese assault or, or, or fait accompli attempt, if you like, to coerce surren surrender uh, at bay. And on the other side of the equation, uh, it's not clear that China's deterrable at all, is it, really? I mean, China feels Very it seems, so intensely about secession issues. They do. That they may be willing to suffer any threat or put up with any threat in order to get what they want if they feel push comes to shove. Absolutely. And that, that is, they have uh, gone to great lengths to make that very clear. Uh, that Taiwan is a core national interest and one at which Beijing will not be deterred if, in fact, Push comes to sub. At the same time, as far as we know, leaders in Beijing are rational actors. They understand that 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 a, a war over Taiwan becomes a very messy affair very quickly. Uh, China has fielded technologies required to make the U.S. defense of Taiwan very very difficult. But if in fact the U.S. is committed to Taiwan's defense, then this is a conflict that escalates very quickly 
Uh, and it is a conflict ultimately between two countries that have nuclear weapons. Not nuclear parity the way the Soviet Union and the, Ameri the United States did during the Cold War, but certainly two countries that can uh, field a great deal of firepower at each other's uh, uh, homelands if necessary. And you mentioned that the United States has security interests and security commitments all up and down mm. uh, the coast of East Asia, all the way from North Korea down to Australia. And in your view, do these cohere? Do they? Is it possible for the United States to articulate a single coherent strategic vision, foreign policy vision, that makes sense of all of these simultaneous connected commitments? Is the defense of Taiwan mm. at all like American yeah. concern about the South China Sea. And what is the American concern about the South China That's Sea? That's an interesting question. I think outside of Taiwan, uh, the United States narrative has been that we are here to to, to, to keep the peace, to keep any power uh, from upsetting the, the way of life, that the, the peace and stability that exists in East Asia, which is the most economically dynamic region in the world, accounts for half the world's GDP. Uh, so, so they would argue, that Americans would argue that their, their presence in, in Korea and Japan and the Philippines is about keeping this peace, it's about keeping the sea lane secure uh, and about facilitating trade that all East Asian countries have benefited from. That's their narrative uh, outside the Taiwan scenario. The Taiwan is very much about defending an al uh, what they perceived, uh, not an ally, a formal ally, a de facto ally that is under a direct threat from an adversary and has been so uh, for 50 years. So the American interest is just keep the peace, don't rock the boat, status quo stability. Yes, if in fact stability has been the status quo. I would argue the last couple of years, uh, uh, China, perhaps as a consequence of the financial crisis, may have seen a window of opportunity here to become a little bit more, I don't like using the word assertive, but a little bit more active uh, in the pursuit of its territorial ambitions in the South China Sea, in the East China Sea, and perhaps towards Taiwan, by virtue of the fact that the U.S. is going broke and is broke. They may have perceive that to be a window of opportunity for them to become a little bit more assertive. Uh, and certainly, I think, recent rhetoric out of Washington and Obama's visit to the region are, are designed to put that concern about Americans, America's commitment to the region at rest. Mm, very good. Well, we'll be back once again with James Manicum. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So James, we're sitting here in the studio of the Center for International Governance Innovation, and it's harder to think of a part of the world that's had more governance innovation. East Asia is extremely well governed if your criterion is a variety of organizations, international, uh, regional organizations designed to accomplish uh, various different and sometimes even identical tasks. Uh, of course, it's in the news again with uh, ongoing discussions now about Canada joining the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is the latest attempt uh, to, I guess, craft a, a freer trade zone mm -hmm. uh, for Pacific Rim countries. But the TPP is only the most recent of a series of yeah, it really is. different. So could you walk us through, uh, if you would, sort of the general um, architecture, or perhaps I should say the, uh, the, um, the galaxy, the array, of um, different regional organizations yeah. and who the players are and who's backing which and how this might evolve over yeah. the course of the next little while. An often used term is alphabet soup yeah. uh, in East Asia. Uh, the TPP is a natural is the outgrowth of, of APEC, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, which is really driven by Japan and Australia, formed in 1989. And that its its ambition was to create a, a Pacific wide free trade area. Uh, you also have ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. That was created by five Southeast Asian countries in 1967. That was very much about avoiding being caught up in, in, in the Cold War. Um, these are five Southeast Asian countries that are bordered by Vietnam when there's a war. Mm -hmm. um, so they're about trying to stay independent of the great power conflict. In the 1990s, ASEAN uh, formed a variety of, 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 of splinter organizations, if you like, related organizations. Uh, which meet regularly, have meet, leaders' meetings and finance ministers' meetings, and defense ministers' meetings, uh, and they and ASEAN engages the great powers of Northeast uh, of Northeast Asia, China, South Korea, and Japan, in dialogue, and then it also reaches out to countries through the ASEAN Regional Forum uh, around the world. Uh, Canada was actually instrumental in in the formation of the ASEAN Regional Forum to discuss broadly non-traditional security issues. Uh, the ASEAN grouping uh, linked up with the three Northeast Asian economies of, of China, uh, South Korea, and Japan formed ASEAN plus three. That is 
an alternative free trade model, if you like, to the APEC and, its, and this TPP subsidiary of APEC. That is certainly China's preferred model. China would prefer to have an East Asian architecture that is free of U.S. Uh, influence and its allies. Uh, so in that context, the fact that the TPP includes Australia uh, uh, and, uh, and now J and apparently Japan, and is, in fact does not include China, uh, suggests that the TPP is viewed by the Chinese with a degree of suspicion, mm -hmm. I think. Um, China has been very good at engaging ASEAN as part of its smile offensive, if you like, uh, in, the, in the latter 1990s and early 2000s. It, it, it um, signed a free trade agreement with ASEAN that came into effect last year. And uh, that was very much aimed at assuaging ASEAN concerns about the impact of China's rise, both military and South China Sea context, but also economic. Um, uh, the, South, the economies of the Southeast Asia are very concerned that China could suck up all the investment, if you like, uh, into low-cost manufacturing, or that in fact uh, China could, could in fact, uh, uh, the Chinese economy could basically result in an offshoring of all of ASEAN's manufacturing into China and leave the ASEAN countries with very little to do. There's been some evidence of that, but we have to see uh, in a couple of years before we fully understand what the impact of the ASEAN-China free trade agreement is. Um, that is, this, is. Is this a Chinese attempt to be hegemonic? Regionally, or is this just China doing what it thinks is in its economic self-interest without any sort of larger mm. geopolitical aspiration? Or is it difficult to tell? It is hard to tell. I think China likes to be the biggest guy in the room when there's a meeting. Uh, and so in that context, it's natural for it to uh, prefer not to work with the United States. Uh, there is a strain of, of, of regionalism for Asians in the ASEAN group. Mahathir Mohamed, former president of Malaysia, was adamant that 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 be uh, 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 the requirement for, for trade in the region. And his East Asia Economic Caucus, or EAC, was actually uh, was actually included the same countries as the ASEAN plus three, the ASEAN plus South Korea, uh, China, and Japan. So there is a, an idea that certainly uh, uh, the, the trade in Asia should be for Asians. Um, but the United States, and Japan in particular, and South Korea, their U.S. allies, have made clear that, that they view a role for the United States. And in light of China's activity in the South China Sea in the last couple of years, the demand for the U.S. diplomatically in the region has gone up. You've seen Vietnam reach out to the United States. You've seen the Philippines just reaffirm its, its security treaty with the United States this summer as a direct consequence of China's behavior in the South China Sea. So there was a time, I think, when Southeast Asian countries w would have lived without, without, without America, but that I think that time is gone. Mm -hmm. And is China increasingly being seen as a constructive potential hegemon in the region, or is it still the case everyone's suspicious of China and just deals with China because they have no choice? I'm thinking particularly of mm. North Korea, right? China was yeah. pivotal in the North Korean issue, uh, mm -hmm. key to the six-party talks, which were as highly unsuccessful as we both know. Yeah, the fact Except in the sense that war didn't break out, perhaps yeah. they were successful I think the in that fact way. that China hosted the talks at the time and in the context it did was seen to be constructive. Uh, I think the fact that North Korea continues to do the things it does, test missiles, test uh, nuclear weapons, and this latest round of confrontations where it sunk the Cheonan and shelled Yongpyon Island, uh, the fact there's a misconception that China has influence over North Korea. Uh, and I don't think the Chinese have that much, because certainly if the Chinese did have influence over North Korea, North Korea I don't think would have tested a nuclear weapon. The Chinese did support the UN, the UN Security Council uh, sanctions that resulted from both those tests of, of nuclear weapons. They have as yet been reluctant to condemn North Korea for the sinking of the Chona and the Yongpyon Island, largely because I think China knows that it, along with South Korea, will have to bear the brunt of any uh, collapse of North Korea, which, again, in authoritarian countries, Kim Jong-il is old. Uh, he is anointed a successor in Kim Jong-un, uh, and he's very young. And if there is some kind of internal power struggle there that goes badly, uh, China understands, I think, that it would have to bear the brunt, along with South Korea, of fixing or of, or of dealing with a collapse in North Korea. And if there is a collapse, is there a security architecture in the reason, region that's capable of handling it? No. Or is it just make it up as you go along? The collapse of North Korea is a black hole uh, into which security planners pour worry and anxiety. Mm -hmm. uh, it, everybody uh, w is worried about that. And I think is, that's why you see uh, countries continue to give North Korea food aid until this year. Uh, because everyone knows that even if they have nuclear weapons, that's actually a less worse outcome than a collapsing North Korea. What happens to the bombs? What happens to the people? It's a black hole. Well, let's hope we continue to muddle through and that the security architecture catches up.
Well, thank you for coming in and uh, sharing your very obviously wide expertise on the region with us. And we hope to have you back to talk further about these ongoing important issues. And we hope to see the audience again. So please join us once again next week for another episode of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube.